School of Revenue Administration, KESRA, is the leading capacity builder of choice in tax, customs, and fiscal policy in Africa. It is one of the only four World Customs Organization, WCO, accredited regional training centers in East and Southern Africa. KESRA is also the regional training institution for African Tax Administration Forum, ATAF, and the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD charter career or business path in tax consultancy, audit, customs, clearing and forwarding, shipping and financial advisory. The Kenya School of Revenue Administration. Transcending to excellence. The Kestra Economic Dialogues is brought to you by the Kenya School of Revenue Administration and the Regional Training Center of the World Customs Organization. Um, and uh, Kestra uh, has partnered with many other international organizations like the African Tax Administration Forum, the World uh, Customs Organization, I mentioned that, and also the OECD, the Organization uh, for Economic Cooperation and uh, uh, Development. In terms of the structuring for this particular webinar, we are going to have about 40 minutes of conversations uh, with the uh, our, our panelists and immediately after that we'll have about uh, 20 minutes of questions and answers. We are joined uh, by viewers and participants uh, from uh, various countries and I'm just going to list them here. We have participants from uh, Abu Dhabi, we have participants from Mexico, the United States of America, Burundi, Rwanda, Colombia, Cote d'Ivoire, Uganda, Lesotho, Tanzania, Malawi, Namibia, South Africa, and Zimbabwe. And of course, we have uh, a multitude of followers uh, watching us uh, through various channels, uh, the Facebook, our Facebook channel and the YouTube channel uh, from uh, Nairobi. And so from wherever you're watching us uh, in the world, we want to say welcome and in the Kenyan uh, Kiswahili uh, language, we want to say Karibu Sana. And so allow me now to quickly introduce our panelists. And I'll start with Dr. Kunio Mikuria. Dr. Kunio Mikuria has been and still is the Secretary General of the World Customs Organization uh, since January 2000. And prior to joining the WCO, Dr. Mikuria worked for the Ministry of Finance, where he was for over 25 years, and he held a variety of senior positions, including Director of Enforcement and Director of Research and International Affairs. Uh, Dr. Mikuria also served as and allowances to coordinate remuneration levels for the entire government of Japan, and as the Budget Controller for Foreign Affairs, Official Aid, and International Aid and Industry. Uh, within the Budget Bureau um, in Japan. In addition, Dr. Mikuria spent time as a counselor at the Japanese Mission to the World Trade Organization in Geneva and participated in the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, uh, commonly known as the GATT, Uruguay Round Trade Negotiations. Dr. Mikuria has a degree in law from the University of Tokyo. Uh, in Japan and a PhD in, in international relationship relations from the University of Kent. And so, Secretary General Dr. Mikuria, we want to welcome you to this call. Let me now introduce our next panelist. And our next panelist is Mwencha. Mr. Erasas Mwencha is the former deputy chairperson of the African. Union Commission, where he served for two terms. Before he left the African Union, Mr. Moncha played a critical role in the establishment of the African Continental Free Trade Area, uh, uh, the current ACFTA, which is just uh, taking effect. Prior to his election to the African Union Commission, Mr. Moncha worked at the Common Market for Eastern and Southern Africa Comesa for 25 years and served as Secretary General. He spurred an increase in trade and interaction among the three regional economic communities, uh, that is 
that is Comesa, Sadiq, and the EAC. Mr. Moncha also developed the organization, the, the continental negotiating position for the Doha round of negotiations of the trade organization. So took part in the development of the Economic Partnership Agreement, the EPAS, the African Growth and Opportunity Act, AGOA, and actively supported the programs to integrate women in development. Prior to joining COMESA, Mr. Mwencha served in the government of Kenya in various, various top positions as a senior economist. Mr. Mwencha has been decorated to the Kenya the elder, the elder of the Golden Heart, EGH, which is a recognition that was bestowed on him by the President of the Republic of Kenya uh, in, uh, in recognition of his contribution to nas- national and regional development. Mr. Mwencha has also been equalized with the highest levels of government recognition by the, go- the government of the republics of Djibouti and Madagascar. Mr. Mwencha holds a master's degree in economics from the York University in Canada and a bachelor of, bachelor's of economics from the University of Nairobi. And so, gentlemen, I want to welcome you and I want to thank you for accepting to be our panelists. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are living in uh, interesting times. Uh, people have called them the COVID-19 uh, uh, times. A time like this last year, no one could have imagined that we would be in the situation that we are in at this, this particular moment. The, the COVID-19 numbers have uh, grown to astronomical levels. And as at yesterday, the COVID-19 numbers globally stood at over 8 million um, uh, affected um, uh, people. And uh, deaths globally have risen to almost half a million uh, people, uh, at about 438,000 uh, as at uh, this, this particular week. In Africa, the numbers are standing at about 244,000 with over 6,500 deaths. What has this done uh, to the world economy? What has this done to the African economy? What has this done to the East African uh, economy? The effect has been huge. And I want to give you a few numbers. We know know that, um, that over 100 nations globally have already applied for support from the IMF. We know that uh, economic projections, economic growth projections for the year 2020 have been uh, more than half. And say if we look at um, numbers in Africa, uh, they are as bad as, uh, you know, or they could be. We have not experienced this uh, for the last, last several years. Millions of people are losing their jobs. Supply chains are broken. Sectors such as transport and tourism are are closed for months uh, now. Social order is in disarray and uh, over 100 countries, like I said, have already applied for support. We are at a situation where internationally uh, donors are approving uh, freezing of uh, debt repayment across the world. And uh, of course, what this has done is that it has triggered the IMF and uh, many other donor uh, partners uh, to develop very heavy war chests to be able to deal with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. The IMF alone has put aside one trillion dollars to be able to manage this particular situation, and so and so we are living in uh, interesting times. And so, uh, Secretary General, you might want to weigh in on this and uh, comment on exactly where we are. What are your your views on uh, exactly what COVID-19 has occasioned in the world economy at this point? 
Well, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, express my condolence to uh, those uh, victims. And, uh, but at the same time, I have to say that especially at the borders, something extraordinary happened. Because of the COVID-19 health situation, uh, borders are uh, quite often close to the movement of people. Uh, whereas uh, uh, for goods, um, borders uh, continue to be open uh, so that the uh, uh, movement of uh, medical supplies, essential goods, and uh, uh, to keep the uh, global supply chain uh, functioning. Of course, uh, customs joins uh, that the fight against the spread of coronavirus, but also we have to provide a lifeline to uh, national economies. And um, also, uh, it is important to see that uh, um, this situation is not exploited by organized crime for uh, illicit trade. So um, all those things uh, have to be balanced. And as you've presented rather bleak uh, picture, uh, economic situation, especially import and export, this is the motor of a national economy, how uh, we can keep that uh, import um, uh, and uh, export functioning, especially for business, because uh, in the end, it is a business uh, that uh, really suffer from uh, this uh, if uh, import and export uh, have problem at borders. And uh, also, um, it is important to provide protection to those who are at borders, whether customs officials or other government agency officers, or and especially business people. So uh, this is the situation we are confronted. Uh, indeed, at uh, how to ensure connectivity at the borders while protecting uh, um, well, our community, but also fighting against uh, coronavirus. So uh, I think uh, this is, uh, well, uh, in a nutshell, uh, the situation we are faced with. Mr. Muncha, uh, what is your what is your view of uh, where we are as a world? This is completely unprecedented. Yes. Um, first of all, the speed with which uh, uh, coronavirus has spread around the world is unprecedented in modern times. The only time we are told there was such a pandemic was in 1918. Uh, Secretary General, Mr. Mikuria, how many countries are under your ambit? 183. 183 countries. What is the level of effect among the 183 countries? You have a kind of a global view of uh, where we are. Yes, um, as you know, uh, this uh, pandemic first started in East Asia and then it has spread. and. Uh, um, uh, well, the first uh, that suffered, uh, especially China, has uh, started to recover. But uh, the problem of this pandemic is that it is not just one time. Second waves, third waves, they are coming. And uh, actually that is happening uh, in East Asia. But uh, um, they are trying to recover. And then uh, that uh, pandemic moved on to Europe and the United States. and. Uh, um, this uh, virus has uh, transformed into more wicked uh, forces. So uh, it has, uh, um, well, hard hit uh, the, those uh, regions. Whereas now, now uh, the pandemic uh, is spreading to uh, emerging economies, as you've seen in uh, well, Russia or Brazil, they are very much suffering. And uh, um, uh, when, when it comes to African continent, at the start, Africa has been prepared rather very well because a pandemic, uh, you have that experience with Ebola and the other well, uh, diseases. So uh, I could see uh, that uh, you are prepared, but um, um, gradually uh, those uh, well, uh, uh, fear of coming, uh, as you have reported at the beginning, and also, uh, if uh, other regions uh, suffer economic loss, as you've said, then um, uh, from Africa, import uh, export market uh, will suffer. So uh, global demand will suffer. So that will affect on uh, global trade. 
So, uh, right, so this um, uh, pandemic's uh, effect is um, spreading on not only once, but uh, um, with the mutation of virus, uh, several waves, and we have to be very much uh, pre well prepared for that. And 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 uh, SG people are certainly not moving out of their countries. Uh, the last meeting that we had in uh, in uh, Brussels was in February. I don't think you've held any other meeting after that, uh, February or March. Uh, is cargo moving? Um, yes. Um, the first meeting wise, uh, I had to stop, uh, postpone all. All meetings, and um, even every year in June we have uh, annual council session. The next week we'll have that uh, virtually, meaning using a video conference. But uh, um, using video conference is great, but the content is rather limited. So this is a dilemma, uh, and uh, we try to uh, push uh, how to move cargo. And for that, um, we need um, well uh, customs uh, um, uh, procedures uh, are proper to be more attuned to this situation, uh, meaning that uh, um, not having a direct contact, but uh, more paperless trade and uh, um, well more um, well risk management um, uh, style is necessary. But uh, um, at the same time, uh, we see that cargo uh, um, are stopping. And for that, uh, um, we have a weekly meeting with the business community and uh, listen to them where uh, they have problems. Uh, cargo really moving and uh, um, we hear from maritime, uh, air and uh, land transport and all of them have problems. So uh, we try to give contact of customs to business and also we try to think about how to tackle these problems uh, uh, of not moving cargo um, as uh, quickly as expected. So uh, we talk to other government agency uh, through international organization um, for uh, well, maritime uh, international maritime organization or ICAO for um, aviation or even road transport and uh, uh, railway transport. Uh, those uh, um, well uh, business uh, associations that uh, we, we talk to them and uh, we issued a joint statement, joint letters and joint actions to try to um, well move cargo. But uh, obviously there is a limit uh, uh, because of the closure of um, restriction of movement of people uh, doesn't help. But uh, um, uh, I could see that all the customer administrations around the world are trying to make huge efforts to uh, ensure that uh, to safeguard the supply chain, especially for essential goods. If, if I could chip in, if I could yes. chip in, yes, chip in, yes, uh, yes. Commissioner, yes. Um, the statistics we are looking at are really grim because if you consider, for example, that 90 percent of cargo is moved by sea, and uh, um, the 10 percent that is moved across by road or by air uh, is also important, particularly to consumer uh, point ends, it's moved by road. And in many countries, because of closures of borders, uh, disruptions of production, we have seen this drop down quite a lot. Uh, by a factor of almost 60 or so percent, particularly for ship. But for air transport, uh, the cargo capacity live alone the passenger has dropped by, by almost 90 percent. Now, if you consider, for example, that cargo, uh, air cargo is about 52 million tons in a year, and you have, you have reduced this to a level of around 5 to 10 percent, this has had huge impact particularly in the supply of essential uh, commodities like fuel, uh, like food, and, and has also had severe consequences uh, in terms of jobs and also health. So yes, this impact is quite heavy. And as, as Ms. Mercuria said, uh, uh, we are seeing resurgence of this COVID in those countries that have tried to open up the economies. And that adding to more uncertainty as to whether the second wave might be. 
and a, a very challenging period in the Yes, uh, and, and Your Excellency, when you served at the African Union Commission as the DCP, as the Deputy Ch- um, Chairperson of the African Union Commission, I remember we visited you in Addis, and I remember how passionately you talked about, uh, you know, bringing Africa together, uh, forming one union in Africa. And uh, we are now seeing uh, the African continental free trade area coming into fruition. However, the statistics have not uh, improved significantly. We are talking about uh, something like 16% intra-African trade. Uh, We are trading within Africa less than we are trading with the rest uh, of the world. But if you look at Latin America, for example, you notice that their um, intra-regional trade is about 19%. In Asia, it is close to 60%. In Europe, it is actually close to 70%, about 68-69%. In North America, it's about 54%. Are we on the right track? Yes. uh we are on the right track, but the speed could be much better than what we have done. Um, and the, the statistics we have spoken to illustrate that. Uh, but of course, this journey, uh, one cannot simply look at it as an event. It is a, it is a process uh, which started with the regional economic groupings. Uh, and if you look at what the regional economic communities have been able to do, and you know them, Mr. Kong community here, you, you yourself are very close to that. Uh, SADC, uh, COMESA, ECOWAS, and the others, they, they, they have been able to make some some progress in those areas. And, and if you look at those areas, within those communities, in tradition of trade is growing, and it's going in the right direction because we see that regional trade being in a pro- products like manufactured goods, whereas Africa exports to the rest of the world is in commodities uh, and very little value addition. And that's why Africa's, uh, although bulk-wise, Africa exports quite a lot, but when you look at value terms, it's very low. It's because of the nature of the trade. And 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 if Africa now has to, and what COVID-19 has done, especially the closures and the impact they has had in Africa. Africa could not access food, Africa could not access uh, uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, because many countries, as you know, they, they even had policies to limit exports. Uh, I think this is also a wake-up call that this speed should increase. But as you have referred to, fortunately, within the continental framework, this is also being given a boost because we now see efforts, concerted efforts, to the continental free trade area. Although this has been slightly delayed because of the COVID, yes, we are on the right track, and that's what I was alluding to. But we could improve the speed, and I hope this COVID-19 is a wake-up call for all of us, and that we can enhance that speed. Uh, Your Excellency, you say that, but if I wanted to travel today to Morocco or to Tunisia or to Cote d'Ivoire, we have uh, people joining us uh, for this particular webinar from Cote d'Ivoire. It is cheaper for me to travel to Paris and then uh, fly to Cote d'Ivoire. It is cheaper for me to travel to Qatar and then, uh, you know, get into another plane and come back to Africa. What is wrong with, um, is it our pricing? Is it the way we we organize ourselves around uh, trade and around movement? I think the challenge is uh, partly uh, structural, that are nature of economies because we trade externally and therefore all routes also tend to point externally. In fact, if you look at whether it's rail, even air transport, they tend to move from extraction centers to the consumer centers, which are not in Africa, but also historical. And we we have tended to retain our trade patterns, uh, whether it's with a former colonial or a new route. This has been that challenge. But it's changing because if you look at uh, the framework for the continental free trade area, there are accompanying measures. 
and some of the accompanying measures is to liberalize air transport. This is one area we have seen quite a number of developments in the continent. Take the example, and I can mention a few cases, uh, Ethiopian Airlines now, which connects quite a number of countries. In fact, I think it's over 50 uh, out of 55, uh, which is also improving that connectivity. And, and also Kenya Airways, South African Airways, uh, but only that their scale is still small, and I hope that they will recover out of this COVID to continue that trajectory. So it's changing, but as soon as we start to see this movement of goods in traffic and trade, uh, this pattern will change. Uh, I remain optimistic. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Mikuria, um, uh, a direct question to you. Are we having enough international cooperation around the resolution of the issues that bedevil uh, supply chains and, uh, of course, touching on uh, customs processes? Um, yes. Um, well, we have the, uh, well, WCO has its uh, standard, the Revised Kyoto Convention, and based on that, WTO produced the Trade Facilitation Agreement. So, how we can uh, help uh, countries implement uh, those uh, um, rules and standards. And uh, um, for that reason, uh, we uh, try to uh, provide uh, assistance to Africa. But uh, I wish that uh, assistance is given by African people. So, uh, our focus is um, raising a pool of experts within Africa so that African uh, people can connect themselves. Well, you talked about uh, well African Union problem, and I agree with uh, uh, His Excellency Mencha that uh, uh, you are on the uh, uh, track. Um, well, uh, problem is often infrastructure, for example, but the infrastructure is not only physical, but institutionally it is well connected. And this is where customs are working with other, uh, or, or other partners, business, but also uh, other government agencies, quarantine authority, immigration authority. So uh, internally, you need that collaboration and this collaboration should be internationally connected. And in that way, uh, we can uh, really prepare the ground for continental African trade. Because when uh, continental African trade area was launched, at the same time, it was boosting the inter-African trade was also launched. So uh, those are the two uh, objectives that uh, from uh, um, customs, that is uh, infrastructure for trade, uh, we are trying to push and uh, for that uh, we want to have more collaborative uh, examples that we want to share. Actually in February I visited Kenya and uh, um, I saw uh, how you are collaborating because you are transit country and in Africa landlocked country is uh, their lifeline is transit country. So, for example, using the technology uh, such as uh, electronic cargo tracking system, you are trying to step by step uh, moving forward. And what we are doing is that uh, um, share this uh, best practice to other African countries and in that way uh, to connect Africa all over. And, and uh, right. SG, uh, that, is, that is a bit interesting, but what you say is the future of customs, given the kind of dynamics that we are seeing? Well, um, for future of customs, um, again, I would like to uh, quote what uh, His Excellency Mencha said, that uh, uh, this is a wake-up call and I want to make it more of an opportunity. Uh, this COVID-19 uh, so that uh, customs can uh, contribute to um, constructing resilient supply chain. And uh, this resilient supply chain supported on one hand by technology, but on the other trust, trust between customer administrations, customs and business, customers and other government agencies. And in that way, we can have a global supply and the trust chain uh, in Africa. That is what uh, we are trying to aiming at using uh, this uh, very good momentum of uh, continental free trade uh, area. Uh, okay, and, and, and uh, Your Excellency, you want to say something? Yes, I was going to put a, put a footnote to what Ms. Mercuria said uh, concerning uh, technology and how this has also 
continues to support African countries to implement trade facilitation. As I indicated earlier, uh, I, 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 I work with the Trademark East Africa. And under Trademark East Africa, we've been working, for instance, with East African community. And now we are going to move to the next frontier of countries where we have supported among the Northern Corridor, Central Corridor, and we have seen the significant reduction of cost of moving and the time. And we are now also moving to the export sector to see how we can support exports. And that digital, what he's talking about, if you look at uh, documentation itself, physical documentation, this has also caused a challenge now under wake up, under this mechanism uh, challenge of COVID. If you went to any of these borders within this particular community during this COVID, you saw almost 60 kilometers of vehicles stranded because there was slow processing of uh, vehicle and drivers to move across, across. But also if the drivers moved across, they were to be quarantined. And so this element of now bringing in a mechanism for electronic trade, but also looking at issues of other transport modes uh, should be able to help uh, if for instance rail would be even faster and so these are some of the issues now we should factor in because in case in future we are going to force these kind of situations we must build in resiliency we must build in innovation but also we must continue to invest in terms of this technology uh, your excellency are our borders then too rigid we have been working on this issue of having one-stop border post. And uh, as you know, uh, East African community and Kenya Revenue itself has been a champion of this. Uh, this system was developing very well, but we also work within sometimes the political context. We work in within challenges like what we faced. So this thing I referred to is not, uh, you know, uh, 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 a systematic is a systemic is a systemic issue. It is one of these challenges that has emerged out of COVID, and I think, which that's what I said, we must then now think out of the box because we are working on a trajectory, not figuring out that yes, you can have a COVID instant, and how do you navigate around that? And I think this is part of the opportunities that uh, Mr. Mercury has referred to. And I, I still want to ask you one more question, Your Excellency. Um, Africa mm. is, a, is a strong 1.3 billion people uh, continent. And uh, we, we have a combined uh, GDP of about 2.6 trillion US dollars, which is basically close to what India uh, has. Are we harnessing the potentials of this population and the potentials of this GDP or uh, our potential to spend uh, at the level at which we should be? That, 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 that should be a really a clarion call to Africa because if you look at uh, India, it is functioning as an economy, as you mentioned. And if you look at parameters, of India and Africa, Africa has got better statistics in terms of, if you look at in terms of uh, reserve and resources, and even much more than what you have just mentioned. But unfortunately, we still operate as 55 economies. And because of that, we are not benefiting from economies of scale. And these are the very issues that the continent of free trade areas are uh, addressing. And this is why we should now keep our eyes on that big price, that Africa should be able to uh, move along the trajectory that we have seen in Europe or China or India tech, harnessing on its uh, And the population in Africa is still in our favor. That's one thing you could mention, because we have a beautiful population. And if we can now take advantage of emerging economies, uh, transformation into manufacturing, industrialization, but also digital economy, Africa should then be a dynamic growth, and I remain positive on this uh, side too. And, and uh, the last time I checked, actually, our median age, especially in the East African region, was below 20, I think at about 18, with uh, Uganda having uh, the lowest uh, median age. 
So yes. I, you are right. You are right in that regard. SG, uh, Dr. Mikuria, uh, the WCO is an important global organization, not just for Africa, but for the rest of the world. But is Africa well represented at the WCO? I think so, uh, because uh, um, Africa, um, especially with this um, African free trade area, uh, we set uh, um, as a priority. And uh, um, we produce many standards, and uh, um, uh, OSVP was mentioned, but also we support with our transit guidelines, and uh, we want to uh, well work. Uh, uh, our uh, really uh, focus used to be transit, which is really uh, Africa. And uh, in addition, uh, we are looking at the digital economy. Well, digital economy is an interesting uh, area where leapfrogging is feasible. Uh, if you don't have legacy system, you can leapfrog. And uh, this is why we are now working with uh, African countries on data analytics, because uh, digital economy produces much data and how we can use that data uh, for our benefit. Uh, often say it is a uh, new gold, uh, new oil, but um, and this is uh, how we work with Africa. And uh, especially in Africa, we work African Union, but also regional economic communities and uh, um, uh, region-wise um, Eastern Southern Africa is well, uh, has a big uh, weight on our agenda setting. And also uh, within our um, well uh, uh, secretariat, we have uh, uh, African colleagues working or uh, at the level of membership, uh, you used to have chairmanship of WCO Council. So uh, it is well represented, but I want you to, to be uh, involved more uh, so that you can get the benefit because well, what we do is sharing best practice and inspire African countries. This is the model that went well in the other parts of the world, how you can um, well uh, uh, embrace those models. And in that way, uh, at the same time, you can connect the African economy to external markets. So uh, Africa is very well represented, and this is one of our big priority. Uh, so uh, j j two very short questions, uh, Dr. Mikuria. Um, what is that one thing that you think that Africa is not doing that it should do? Well, um, uh, our um, first, uh, um, our vision is borders divide, customs connect. Customs should be uh, um, connecting uh, um, force at the borders. And how we can do that? It is, again, uh, through human interaction. So um, I'm confident that uh, um, African um, customs will build up uh, trust uh, which is the basis of any partnership for connectivity uh, with business and uh, with other government agencies. And uh, um, so this is why our focus is on human resource development uh, uh, when it comes to our assistance to Africa. And, and uh, SG, we have customs officers and uh, scholars, uh, you know, government administrators, tax administrators uh, watching you from uh, Abu Dhabi, Mexico, USA, Burundi, Colombia, Cote d'Ivoire, Uganda, Lesotho, Tanzania, Malawi, Namibia, South Africa, Zimbabwe, and Kenya. And uh, there may be other countries that we may not have listed here. What is that one message that you'd like to send to customs officers? Well, um, actually, uh, naturally, uh, every year we set a uh, well, theme of the year. And the theme of this year, it is very relevant to COVID-19. This is customs fostering sustainability for people, prosperity, and the planet. Originally, at the beginning of this year, I thought uh, mm, it is a bit more focused on environmental protection, but now, uh, with COVID-19, this sustainability, uh, resilient uh, um, supply chain has gained another relevance. So uh, this is what uh, um, customs can contribute to um, fostering sustainability and uh, um, contributing to our people uh, and of course prosperity and the planet. That will be my message now.
Uh, thank you. Your Excellency, uh, we are coming to the end of uh, this particular engagement. Uh, time has really gone, uh, but I'll ask you uh, two questions uh, as well, very short questions. Uh, like I said, you've been very, very passionate about trade, about supply chains, uh, not just in Kenya, but across the region. You've worked very closely with the various uh, regional blocks uh, that are there. What is it that you'd want improved in the region? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mugambi, for that very important question. Uh, the region must continue relentlessly to pursue uh, the aspect of integration, in particular trade integration. And here, change of mindset is important because we still see a mindset where people think that uh, when you trade with each other, it's a zero-sum game, but they don't realize it's a win-win situation. And even those that might see temporal uh, challenges in some of the sectors, uh, that mechanism must be put in place to support them so that they can get over, get over that hurdle in the short term. The second one is to continue to focus on value addition and also those sectors that can help Africa address poverty and prosperity uh, within the continent and also create employment. And I see good opportunities, especially in the area of agro industries, which Africa can export, produce and export, and Africa actually is, can be a, paspec, a basket, a food basket for the rest of the world. And the third one, we must focus on developing skills, especially digitalization. Ah, good. Uh, we now uh, have a number of uh, questions uh, coming in, and uh, I will just ask these questions uh, randomly. And uh, any of our two panelists, it's a liberty to answer. And uh, the first question coming from the audience is this one. I'll just read it verbatim. Seeing that politics plays a big role in the efficiency of supply chains, which also impacts on the operational costs of the various players in the chain. What is WCEO's opinion of what needs to be done to address this? I think this really goes to Dr. Mikuri, actually. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, efficiency of supply chain. Uh, uh, we can't ignore the political uh, situation. And uh, um, uh, this, uh, especially COVID-19, has set uh, us the importance of uh, focusing on uh, politics or policy. And uh, more uh, international collaboration is necessary on one hand. On the other, we need to really um, uh, address um, with agility uh, to be responsive. And this is why we try to get uh, how technology can help us in addressing the new supply chain, perhaps more sustainable supply chain, and uh, also uh, how uh, we can um, raise uh, the skills, skill set of customers, officers, or business. They have to evolve. So uh, this is what uh, uh, I've been thinking and uh, uh, turn this COVID-19 uh, to uh, build up more um, efficient supply chain, but with a human face and uh, thinking about uh, um, uh, these uh, um, exceptional circumstances uh, and uh, emergency circumstances uh, to, to address that and uh, um, uh, try to get uh, well, more um, uh, um, life, uh, people's life, uh, more attuned to that, uh, um, responding to people's life is what uh, um, I want to see the evolution of a supply chain in the future. And for that, we share what WCO will do is share ideas and uh, um, uh, also collect and share ideas and also uh, develop uh, technology and show how we can use, for example, um, information technology, but uh, data, how we can uh, exploit data uh, for the purpose of, uh, uh, well, uh, supply chain improvement. So, uh, and uh, for that, uh, again, it is uh, the human uh, interface, human trust, and uh, uh, authorized economic operators and other tools that uh, we have. And this is what uh, we want to offer to our members. Okay, 
Uh, there is a question here for Your Excellency, Mr. Mwencha. What can African treasuries and revenue authorities do to collect more, but at the same time facilitate trade more? Uh, that is a very good question. Um, first of all, even at the African Union, there has been a reflection on how to improve the revenue base so that Africa can finance more of it, its uh, uh, activities through domestic financing mechanisms. And one of the things that, uh, as you mentioned earlier on the statistics, that Africa has only an average of 12 13% of uh, tax to GDP, uh, is to improve the tax base. Uh, and improving the tax base means uh, bringing many of um, most of the activities which are not in the radar of modern economy, uh, the informal sector which is large, but also expanding opportunities so that you can improve and and bring some of those activities. Uh, for instance, I've seen if you intervene in the sector of agriculture and bring uh, aggregation, uh, improve the small scale farmers, put them in the supply chain. You are expanding opportunities, but also you are expanding your revenue base. So that is one of the, the aspect is expand your cake. The other one, of course, is to improve efficiency. And efficiency, Mr. Mr. McCurry has referred to uh, efficiency in terms of tax collection, but also revenue, uh, expenditure and all that, so that you can be able to improve on, uh, on your tax base. So on one side, improve the economy, the other one, improve efficiency, including trade facilitation. Thank you. And uh, the next question, this question keeps coming up in uh, basically all the webinars that uh, we have. And the question is, how do you keep your staff productive while they work at home? Any of you can uh, tackle this one. How do you keep your staff productive while they work from home? Okay, okay. Um, well, in the WCO, um, we adopted uh, from uh, March um, uh, teleworking. And uh, um, fortunately, um, uh, we are in a position to provide uh, technical support to our, our staff so that uh, all staff are virtually connected. And uh, um, uh, at the management level, uh, we um, well, we we, we um, organize weekly management committee. Uh, in the past, it was monthly, but now weekly uh, to enhance communication. And uh, then I ask uh, uh, directors and deputies to do the same to replicate that uh, uh, enhanced uh, um, uh, communication with their staff, so that uh, communication uh, goes two ways. Uh, so that uh, we can share what we have to do to serve our members uh, in this um, well uh, crisis time. And uh, then uh, also uh, we identify uh, from uh, our stakeholders, especially uh, private sector um, partners, what they want us to do. And also uh, from customer administration, what they look from us. So we get that and through that communication, we uh, ask our staff to do that. And uh, um, also another thing is that uh, our means operations are usually meeting and missions, but now it is um, not possible in a traditional way. So how to use technology? Now uh, we are pushing our um, capacity building technical assistance delivery through online. We offer that. And, uh, um, and for that, uh, we need to enhance the skills of our staff, how to do a um, webinar, for example. And uh, for webinar, it is different from a usual um, lecture. Uh, you need to attract people. So uh, in that way, uh, we already um, uh, produced a guidance document for communication, internal communication, and now we are shaping up a guidance document, guidelines for how to do uh, communication virtually with our members and stakeholders. So in that way, uh, we try to um, address that. And also you need to, uh, yeah, to, in to ensure visibility what we are doing 
So uh, we uh, uh, improved our website and uh, we try to put as many uh, message as possible to show that this is what we are doing, uh, our visibility. And if you have uh, something, feedback, please get uh, back to us. So in that way, uh, essentially communication is the key. Okay. So more addition to that, uh, in, 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 the, in the organizations that I'm associated with, we have had to look at our KPIs and we have revised them as downwards because for those operations that are easy to carry out digitally, uh, you know, they were able to be maintained at levels even not even better than what we had anticipated because of this enhanced awakening, uh, you know, realization. But also, there are operations that are not very easy to do online. And, and, and because of that, inevitably, you may not achieve 100%. But if an organization is able to achieve 70 to 80% uh, in this COVID situation, it's much better off because uh, some of the organizations we chose not to lay off people as part of corporate responsibility, but also to be able to have even a shift so that you can bring a smaller team, uh, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, to respect social distancing or uh, on a daily basis so that you avoid unnecessary movement. But as Mr. Mekuria mentioned earlier, we have had big challenges, especially even public transport. So that is still a restraint. But I must say the situation doesn't look as desperate. There has been an effort. And I think to some organizations which I'm associated, I'm so happy to see a level of 70 to 80% still maintenance in our key performance indicators. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, SG, and uh, this will be the last set of questions. Uh, we can be here the whole evening. It's very exciting. Uh, we have so many questions, uh, but we are going to see how we deal with the other questions. Uh, at this point, before I can ask you this question, I want to recognize uh, that uh, Kenya's Commissioner, Acting Commissioner of Customs, is actually uh, watching. Uh, is, is she's on the, this webinar. Uh, that is uh, Mrs. Pamela Ahago. Uh, she's with us. Although the comment that I'm going to read here is not coming from her, uh, it's coming from a, a customs uh, officer. And, and so, uh, Secretary General Mikuria, the, 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 there is a question and a comment. And the question is what specific programs do you have for African uh, customs officers, especially with regard to cap and uh, um, uh, we talked about uh, trade facilitation. Uh, well, trade facilitation is uh, really, it is more on, well, uh, trade efficacy, which will not only, um, well, improve efficiency, but also even revenue collection. So uh, that is a very important part. And uh, um, uh, we have our Mercator program, uh, which is for trade facilitation. But now I'm talking with African Union Secretariat, especially uh, uh -huh. uh, Continental Free Trade Area Secretariat, the newly one that how we can, well, um, modify our model to cater for um, this uh, Continental Free Trade Area. So, and also, um, as I repeated, um, uh, uh, human resources is important. We have a master trainers program and we produced many uh, trained the trainer trainers and uh, uh, we are happy that we can mobilize those well-trained um, African officers, especially from uh, East African community region to mobilize in other parts of the world. Uh, so uh, there are some of um, uh, some of our um, programs. There are many others, but um, uh, in general, uh, we are trying to get uh, to tr identify what are the uh, needs and how we can respond to needs. So we continue to evolve our programs uh, for Africa. And with regard to Kenya, uh, yes, uh, I'm waiting for your apply uh, applications because uh, constantly uh, we advertise our post, um, our technical officer, but also technical attaché and also um, uh, well, uh, program managers. So uh, 
uh, I, uh, I always talk, whenever I talk to KRA top management, I always suggest, why don't you send a good,、uh, good officer to WCO? And、uh, because you have proved to be very、um, more efficient and competent. Excellency, maybe can you give us your, your last word?、Uh, what is your,、uh, do you have a last comment that you'd like to make? First of all, I'd like to thank you for organizing uh, this uh, uh, webinar on a topical issue,、uh, but also to、uh, appeal to particularly the listeners who are out there,、uh, and many of them doing very critical jobs because you are really among the frontline workers, even、uh, under this COVID, because you are at ports, you are at borders, you are at the airports. Uh, but also those who are in other aspects of supply chain,、uh, that really you are contributing a lot to our economy, to our growth, and、uh, please continue to do the woodwork. But also now to say,、um, we, we, the, the world is, is at crossroads.、Uh, it, on one hand, those who may see opportunities, this is the moment. And, and I want to remain with this team. Uh, the others would be seeing challenges and perhaps very worried. I don't want to subscribe to that. And here is an opportunity for us to continue to push for more trade facilitation, for more integration, for better growth, but also for us to make a better world、uh, than we find today. Thank you very much,、uh, Your Excellency.、Uh, SG, Dr. Mikuria, your last word. Oh,、well, thank you.、Um... Uh, what、uh, um, Excellency has said exactly what、uh, I say usually at the end that、uh, let's work for the betterment of the world. And、uh, we customs are、uh, on the borders,、uh, on the ground, that、uh, we can make a difference. Together, if we work together, we can make a difference. So、uh, let's try to,、uh, to achieve that goal of make a difference and、uh, um, improve the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And so, ladies and gentlemen, this has been the Kestra Economic、uh, Dialogues organized by the Kenya School of Revenue Administration. And、uh, Kestra is also the regional training center,、uh, one of the four regional training centers of the WCO, of the World Customs Organization in East and Southern Africa. Our partners are Mauritius, South Africa, and、uh, RTC, Zimbabwe. Kestra Economic Dialogues is organized. As a high level conversation、uh, between ourselves and uh, respected uh, personalities across the globe.、Uh, and、uh, we basically delve into issues touching on customs, tax, and fiscal policy. During today's economic dialogue, we had、uh, our partners、uh, tuning in.、Uh, we want to thank. The Moi University.、Uh, we had a number of、uh, people from Moi University tuning in. We want to thank the Jomo Kenyatta University of Agriculture and Technology. We want to thank the four regional training centers that I mentioned Zimbabwe, South Africa, and Mauritius, and of course, our own faculty and students here、uh, in Kenya. We want to thank people who tuned in from various countries, and I'm just going to repeat them. We had、uh, viewers coming from as far away as Abu Dhabi, Mexico, the United States, Burundi, Colombia,、uh, uh, Colombia, sorry, Cote d'Ivoire, Uganda, Lesotho, Tanzania, Malawi, Namibia, South Africa, and、uh, Zimbabwe. I want to also thank the Commissioner General of the Kenya Revenue Authority. I want to thank my fellow commissioners. I want to thank specifically the Commissioner of Customs for the support uh, that uh, she continues uh, and uh, the support that、uh, the Customs、uh, Department continues to give、uh, this particular engagement. And so,、uh, from Nairobi and uh, uh, from all of us, myself and the technical team, That I also wish to thank at this point, there was quite a big team behind us that kept uh, us uh, you know,、uh, moving within this particular platform. I want to thank this team and I want to thank all of you for having tuned in. So thank you very much and from Nairobi. Thank you.